I'm, I'm so sorry. Angie has just informed us that someone who's driving a Taurus, a 1999 or so Taurus, has left their motor going, but their doors are locked. So if you're driving a Taurus, you may, may want to just go out and check on it. Thank you. I think she's, you said it was blue, Angie? Grayish blue? Okay. Thank you. Have you all heard the news? Have you all heard the news? Y'all better get ready. Jesus is coming soon. He's coming as a thief and a robber by night.
While you are turning with me to the gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter, those first eight verses will be where we will direct our attention. How many of us enjoyed last Sunday at Guthrie Green? I am grateful to God for the weather that he did give us. Amen. But I am extremely proud and grateful to you for showing up in spite of that somewhat inclement weather. I am grateful for what I felt the joint service did for this city. We're not trying to showboat or promote either of the churches. We're just simply trying to be obedient to God for whatever he directs us to do. All right. All right. And I am so grateful that Dr. Hess agreed to do the last part of that service which was actually a statement to this city of how we can come together yes. Yes, sir. All right. and how we can work to make this city a better city. Yeah. Yeah. I could not have done what he did. And the text that he selected was most appropriate for what we were trying to do and the prayer that he prayed afterwards. And then our walk to the John Ho Franklin Park for prayer for me made the day just a huge blessing and calls for our gratitude to God for the way that he is working in us. Yes, Continue to be in prayer for that because we have not yet realize what this is going to do and we have not yet realized where God is taking us but we'll just walk in faith yes, sir. until we can walk in sight Amen. and we'll be obedient to whatever God is leading us to do next Sunday is first Sunday and that's our communion Sunday and the such, but I'm having a special guest come on next Sunday to, in preparation for what we are getting ready to try and do here at Antioch, to speak to the women of our church. And I would like for all women to wear white on next Sunday. Will that be all right? I don't care if they're pants, I don't care if it's a dress, I just want us to dress in white. And also, Angie, for the women to sit in this middle section on next Sunday. Miss Karen Pittman is going to be speaking to the women on next Sunday. Living as a Ruth in a Delia 
society. And if you want to go back and read that story of Deliah and also the story of Ruth, you can go do that. Because there are some challenges that we have. We've seen it all week on TV, all week long. And we are hoping, you see, this, this is my problem. I'm through with talking about the problem. I'm through with saying what we ought to do. I want to do some things. And so I'm just asking God to give me the resources and the means to do that. And so on next Sunday, that's what I'm wishing will happen for us as women here in this church. And then that afternoon, sometime around five, we're getting ready for the annual pastor's board meeting. So I would like for, to meet with all leaders around five o'clock or early if you wish, it does not matter for me. Or we can do it before we even go home for morning worship. Just let me know what you prefer to do. Carolyn, are you complete with the pass out you were gonna do? That's all done? Okay, because on, we were going to do pass out some things that we done during the vacation Bible school on this Wednesday, but we were also going to try and have, not try, we were also going to have a situation where instead of us going out for this first Wednesday, I've invited some people to come and talk to us about some things. Talk to us about our wills, our insurances. Vicki is going to present, Derek Alexander Jr. is going to present, Tara Payne is going to present, Jack's Memory Chapel is going to present, and there uh, is a lawyer that's going to come and present and talk to us about wills. That, getting things ready for the inevitable yes, sir. and protecting and caring for ourselves so that we are ready for those moments. So that's going to happen this Wednesday at 630 uh, in lieu of our going out for this first Wednesday. We will not have watch service anymore with the Met. We're going to do our own watch service. And I am going to have it set up where our youth will have their own watch service in this area over here in the new edition. But in whatever they plan for that watch service, we will yet require them to bring the new year in on their knees. But however they fashion what they do during that evening, that's okay with me. And then the adults, we will be in here and we're in the process of planning that watch service. We are grateful to the Met Metropolitan Baptist Church for all these many years of joining with us in the watch service and bringing the new year in. But now we're going to go back and start doing watch service as Antioch Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. Uh, things Pray in the mornings. I want you to stop whatever you're doing in the morning at some point and pray for tomorrow we're going to be getting inspections. And we want those inspections to be without problems. So I want you to just ask God to let the inspections pass. Now we did have, they came back on last Friday to, oh and by the way, you need to go by, and I'm naming it my kitchen. <laughs> it has been a headache deluxe. You need to go by and look at my kitchen before you go home today. <laughs> because the Lord has really blessed in that kitchen, and it has been a pure headache. <laughs> but it's ready, and I think you'll be proud of it. And I think we'll be able to do a lot of things in these days and years to come with what God has blessed us with in that kitchen. So before you leave today now, go by and look at my kitchen. <laughs> but I think those are the, this Wednesday, 
6.30, be here for those special presentations. First Sunday, if the women will wear white, we will have communion, but our guests for that day will be Karen Pittman. Uh, we'll start planning for the watch services. Uh, immediately after church, because of the Sunday school dinner for this afternoon, uh, all my young men stand up right now. There you go, Michael. Stand back up. All of our young men. I mean, if you're a young adult, come on, Ricky, get on back up there. Yeah. Come on, where is, I don't see Marky, I don't see Aaron, I don't see Derek. They out? They, you guys, stand up. I need you to stand up. Where is Marky? Okay. Immediately after church, you all need to come down to the front with me because we're going to set up for the Sunday school dinner. Now, don't go, ah. Uh, <laughs> you know, I've been seeing women, I've been seeing men who got back problems and knee problems. I've been seeing us struggling with chairs and young men out there ripping and running and having fun. So today, young men, you go join me and we go set up for the Sunday school dinner for this afternoon. Now, parents, if your child ain't here, don't make me, go grab him and get him back in here. We won't be long. All we got to do is set up the back part. Make sure your son stays here. He ain't going to be here long. You'll be home and getting your dinner. But I do need for them to start participating in what we're doing around here. Now, they need to grow up to learn how to carry their weight in what the church is trying to do. So bless me with that. And that's immediately following the morning worship. I certainly will not be before you long. In that 18th chapter, In that eighth verse, Jesus said in that parable, I tell you that he will avenge them speedingly. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Nevertheless, when God has done what he has promised to do, when God has done what he is faithful in doing, when God has brought you out of your situation, Amen. when God has blessed you, will he really find faith on the earth? I want to use as my thought God's response to importunate prayer. God's response to importunate prayer. And that word importunate is defined as being overly persistent, overly persistent in a request or a demand. It's defined as repeatedly asking for something in a forceful way, repeatedly asking for something in an annoying way, repeatedly asking for something until you get on somebody's nerves. Amen. I know that we have been taught or someone has suggested at least 
that when you pray, you ought to leave it alone and don't be going back and forth to God about what you have prayed for. Just pray it, sit back, and wait till he act. And I'm not going to try to debate that or challenge that because certainly it could well be argued that that's the way that a true believer act. But I also believe that some true believers find themselves going back over and over to God with their requests, especially if God seems to tarry in his coming. And my argument would go, I don't have a problem going back to God over and over until I understand his response to what I am praying. Let me clarify that. Until he tells me to shut up, leave it alone, I'm going to keep going back, especially if he seems to tarry in responding to my prayer. And I'm not going to feel bad about that. But when he tells me to shut up, I will shut up. But I don't have a problem going back, repeating over and over what I have prayed. And I know he heard me the first time. I know that heaven has already started preparations to meet my prayer. I know that earth has been ordered to participate in meeting my problem. But until I see God in my faith even, that prayer will be steadily upon my lips. And I won't feel bad about that. Some of us need to worry God right now. Some of us need to annoy God right now about something that's going on in our lives. That we are finding it difficult to deal with. Keep going to him until he tells you to shut up or he answers your prayer or he gives you peace as he answers your prayer. He ain't mad at you for continuously asking him, repeating that prayer over and over. Because as I will try to point out in that eighth verse, and I'll give you a little snippet of it right now, God is concerned if we will get so frustrated that we will cease the prayer before he responds to the prayer. Now that's just a snippet, and I'll get there a little later. Because Luke tells us immediately what this parable means. He says men should always pray and not lose heart. And you need to underline that lose heart. That men should always pray 
and don't get disgusted. Don't give up. Don't quit just because it appears that God didn't hear or he is tearing in his response to you. So Luke said, Jesus tells this story of a woman, a widow, he says, who refused to get frustrated in her request. <laughs> he says there was a certain judge who did not fear God or care what people thought about him. He did not fear God, meaning that he was unprincipled, he had reckless character, and he did not care about what God thought about what he did. He did what he wanted to do or what was in his best interest. And he did not want to afford God messing with that. Anybody hear me right there? Yes, sir. Anybody ever set God to the side because you did not want God fearing in your determination of what you wanted that you felt was in your best interest. Did I say that too fast? That happens. We set God to the side because we don't want him to participate in what we have determined is for our best interest. We are fearful that God will disagree with us and want to do something different. And we have spent all this time determining that this is the best for what interests me. And so we excuse God for a moment while we entertain that which we have determined is best for us. This man, this judge, had come to the determination that I don't care what God thinks about what I do. I don't fear God. And then Luke says, he did not care what people thought about him. He had no regard for others that he was only interested in people as he used them to facilitate his best interests sound like anybody we know he only thought of people as they could be used in what was best for him. But he did not care about their well-being. And that's what Luke has in mind here. He did not care about their well-being. Only what was best for him. He did not fear God or what people thought about him. But remember, I threw another little something into that. It was not only that he didn't care what people thought about him, but he didn't even have the love enough in his heart to care what was best for people. And that's a greater issue. Because you are concerned about the welfare of somebody else ought to engage you in good character and conduct as it relates to others. But when you have no regard for their well-being, if you don't care if they make it or not, all you care about 
How many people do we throw under the bus every day? That's all I'm trying to say. We love them. We got them close to us. Hugging them all up. Until our best interest is challenged. And if they have to be the sacrifice for our best interest, put them under the bus. His reckless character offered no good for opinions concerning the well-being of others. And because he was of such, this woman's case was dead before she even stood before him. He didn't care what she had to say. She didn't, he didn't care that somebody was misusing her. He didn't care that she had been cheated. It hadn't happened to him. So he says to her, away. Because the suggestion here is, she kept going back to him over and over again, and he kept turning her away. I don't know if he turned her away with promises. I don't know that. I don't know if he was just indignant and said, get out of my face. I don't know that. Luke does not share that with us. But one thing we do know is every time she came back, she got nothing. But the key is she kept coming back. She refused to give up. She was a widow. And in that Eastern society, Widows were not really cared for. They were of a lesser class. And I don't have time to go in there, but you can imagine in your mind why. If you remember that their situation was of such that Jesus had a purse for them and Judas was the one who held the purse. That whenever a widow or someone in need came to Jesus for help, he directed them to Judas. One commentator argued that this is what caused Jesus, Judas to lose his head. That when those widows came to Judas and he reached in the purse, y'all hear me now, that Jesus had created and gave them the money and they said thank you he didn't say give thanks to God he said you're welcome <laughs> I hope you all pray with me this morning but Jesus was sensitive to the issues that they <laughs> they had the apostles even called a whole group of men into existence. Called deacons. Because there had been a great conflict between different races as to how the widows were being cared for. <coughs> and one race was being slighted while the other one was seemingly taken care of. And they came to the apostles and said, this is not fair. So the apostles said, look out among you and select seven men that they can take care of this matter because we don't have time. That does not mean that the apostle was not sensitive to the cause of the widows. They said, our time need to be spent in prayer. Our time need to be spent in hearing from God so that we can create the purses that the widow somebody ought to be praying with me. So you call seven men and give them this task because we do want the widows and the orphans to be cared for. Now you have deacons who are in charge of. 
Y- y- y'all got to allow me this footnote. That's the charge. That's the reason for the existence. And I know that because of the different types of circumstances that have come up since then, there are some other kind of responsibilities. But I argue till I die, you ought not to leave the primary cause of your existence. Because Jesus cared enough about them. He created the purse. But this society, (coughs) this judge, did not hold the widows in high esteem. They were a lower class. But she comes before the judge and asks him, to get justice for me. Now there are some writers who argue that what she actually really did was she came and asked the judge to avenge her. That's a harsher usage than get justice for me. To come to that judge and say avenge me actually shows no respect to the judge and his position and authority. You can't tell me what to do. Avenge is the stronger word. You get this done for me. Avenge me. Versus what some of the writers who are a little bit kinder and a little bit more humble says, hear my case and go and get justice for me. I don't know. I remember some of them old women (laughs) when they felt like they had been misused that hat went to the side y'all ought to pray with me (laughs) that hand went on the hip the other finger went in the air (laughs) and they wasn't trying to be nice either Some writers argue that. She was saying, avenge me. But the judge did nothing. She kept coming back. And finally he said, though I don't fear God, though I don't have any regard for the well-beings of others, because this woman Where is me? I will do what she has asked me to do. Because she is so persistent, I'll do what she has asked me to do. Is Jesus saying to us that our persistence Our wearing God, our knowing God will cause God to do for us what we are asking. That seemed to be the suggestion of the parable. He said men ought to always pray and not lose heart. Keep on praying, keep on asking, keep on going back. But what Jesus has in mind is not an evil judge who because somebody was threatening, one writer argued this, that he was afraid that the woman might strike him. That she might get so mad in her situation and he not doing it. You all praying with me? That she might strike him. She might just get angry with him and hit him. One writer made that argument. But we don't have an evil judge who has no regard for the well-being of others. We have a God who is loving. But God knows what's best for us. That's why he don't show up until he has conditioned and prepared. (coughs) 
what's best for us. We need to understand <coughs> that sometimes God says, if I give, you to you, give it to you right now, you'll mess it up. What I'm going to do is prepare you for this blessing. Because blessings are too important for me to give to you when you ain't ready for it. Somebody should have said amen right there. <laughs> Here you are, ain't ready for it. And because God is tearing, <coughs> you are mad at God. And we will not get mad at the Department of Transportation when it now says you got to go to driver's school, you got to study, you got to pass a test, and then you got to wait six months before you can take the driver's test. And what do we do? We study, we prepare, we go take the test, and then we wait six months because what they are saying is, I ain't going to give you a license until I am sure that you're ready to drive. Why? Because it's not only about you, others are. I ain't going to put you on a road when you don't know what you're doing and kill somebody. And God is saying, this blessing that I give you is so important to me that I'm going to prepare you first for the blessing. And it depends on how responsible and responsive you are as to how much he has to prepare. But there are conditions to importunate prayer. Persistent prayer is all I'm saying. First of all, you have to have the sense of need. We need to stop going to God, telling him what to do, as if we are in control of this. We have to understand that the reason we went to him is because we couldn't handle the situation. <laughs> we need to understand that we need him. He does not need us. We need him. And so I have to understand that my first move is to understand that I have a need that I cannot satisfy. And then I have to have the desire to get it. Now, somebody would argue, well, everybody who understands their need will automatically have a desire to get it. But I don't buy that. Sometimes we recognize we have a need, but we're fearful of what, it, what will happen or what it takes to make them talk, to satisfy the need. You all pray with me. <laughs> to satisfy the need. And so therefore, we don't really have, well, Lord, you know, if, you, if it's in your will, if you see fit, if you think it's all right for me, and somebody said, that's an awesome prayer. <laughs> but what importunate prayer says, not only have I understood I have this need, but I want it to be supplied. Stop letting people tell you you want it too bad. Anybody ever heard that? It ain't going to happen because you want it too bad. N nobody heard that? Am I the only one? No. You want it too much. It ain't going to happen. You should want it. You should want it to happen. That's the reason you're on your knees. <clears throat> Not if, but you want it to happen. The third thing is you have to believe that God has in store what we desire. In other words, it's real simple. All you have to believe that God is able. Yes, yes. 
to meet your desire. And then you have to understand that if he holds back for a while, if he is slow in arriving, as we term it, we have to still know that he loves us simply for the asking. I need to explain that one. When God seemed to tarry in responding to our call or our plea, we have to understand and believe that he loves the fact that we have asked. That excites God. That gets God moving. He loves to be asked. And then the last thing is believing the asking will obtain. Believing that what I have asked for is actually going to happen. But then I'm almost through. I get down to the latter part of this parable. And Jesus says, I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Speedily. That the relief which to our impatience seems so long in coming will actually arrive. But God and his wise counsel will not come until he's ready for it. And we are ready for it. Yes, sir. It did not matter that Martha and Mary had sent requests to Jesus about their sick brother. He tarried yet where he was. And then he waits until Lazarus has been dead for four days, and then he shows up. We can understand Martha and Mary's argument that if you had just dropped what you were doing, and had got on down here, our brother would still be living. But Jesus knew he did not have to hurry because he was the resurrection and the life. And that's exactly what he says to Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. You can live and die and live again and you can live and never die. The point is, do you believe. It did not matter that those disciples fought a storm the night long. In this boat struggling with a storm, I'm sure that they looked back at the shore from where they had left Jesus to see if Jesus was coming. But Jesus waited until they had toiled the whole night long, and then he showed up. Amen. He wasn't worried about it. Matter of fact, another writer talked about Jesus in the back, behind the part of the boat, sleep. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And they struggling with the storm. And then asked him, do you care not that we perish? Jesus is not all caught up about those things. Because all he has to do is speak, yes. peace be still, yes. and storms cease. Yes, Jesus is not so caught up in your struggles because he knows all he has to do is wink his eye, yes. bow his head, the poet said, and all my griefs. Yes. But this is what God is concerned for. When I return, will I still find faith on the earth? Yes, sir. The fear is not that God will delay granting the help needed, but that we will cease to pray while we wait. Jesus spoke these words to show that when faith fails, prayer dies. In order to pray, we must have faith, and our faith must not fail. 
We have to believe not only that God can do it, but we must believe that he will do it. Faith pours forth prayer and the pouring forth of the heart in prayer gives steadfastness to faith. Jesus is simply saying to us, you have to keep heart after you pray. You have to believe that I am going to answer your prayer. You have to understand that I may not answer it in the way that you want to answer it. But I guarantee you it will be answered in the way that's best for you. I love you just that much. I leave you with this. Do you have the faith to support the prayer that you have paid? Will your faith be persistent enough? Strong enough? That your prayer will hang on until God answers. <clears throat> will you trust God to do what you have asked him to do? Because the devil was present when you prayed your prayer. And the devil started doing things too. Also. Not to bless your prayer. But to hinder your prayer. Wrong decisions, wrong actions. Yeah. Don't believe it's going to happen. This person coming, you ought to do something. Jesus said, I just want to know. <clears throat> Did you have faith enough in what you asked for? Yeah. Then faith enough in me. See, sometimes we pray prayers that we don't even have enough faith. That's right. In the prayer that we prayed. Anybody hear that? Your needs should have driven your prayer to the heart. And God says, I got you. You don't have to worry about this. I got you. And when I decide to answer, I'll send speedily all that you stand in need of. It will not tarry. It will come. The point in time that I have pointed for it to come. So I'm asking the question to us. Are you persistent in the prayer that you have prayed? Yes, sir. The need that you have. Are you about ready to give up? <clears throat> Are you about ready to say, oh, it ain't going to happen? Because if it was going to happen, it would have happened by now. No, that ain't true. God ain't going to let it happen until he's ready for it to happen. <clears throat> the thing I would suggest is you sit down and get a sheet of paper and write down possible reasons why God might be tearing and answering your prayer. And visit those reasons every day. And if any of those reasons are on you, Work on changing them. Yes, and when you get them changed, put a check mark by it yes. and go on to the next one. Yes, and when you have gotten to the last and you have checkpointed, look for God's prayer because it's right around the corner. Yes, that means I'm ready for God's blessing. We extend the privilege of the church. If there's one who would like to make his confession, we invite you to come. <laughs>
we invite you to come.
Pam Thompson is requesting prayer for Karen Jones, Tish Jones, and Jack Jones. Geneva Elrich is asking prayer for Larry Crawford. Linda Riley and a support group wants us to know that Rayfield is a lot better and that Sheila is out of ICU. Amen, amen. Yuli Andrews has a praise report that she received a thank you letter from the Queen, of, Queen Elizabeth of England. Amen. This is a thank you note, Reverend Potter and Antioch family. On behalf of my children and I, uh, we would like to thank you for demonstrating God's love and, and taking care of and supporting us during the loss of my wife. Amen. There are no words that can explicitly express our appreciation and gratitude for all of your expressions. Please know that your cause, calls, text messages, visits, flowers, food, monetary gifts, and most importantly, your prayers have made a difference. And we are encouraged to stand in our grief and yet trust God. Please continue to pray for, for us. Eternally grateful. This is from Reggie, Jeremiah, and Kate and Ivy. Amen. I, I want to do this. I see call here this morning, call Stephen. How is Miss Stevens doing? Okay, good. Okay, good. Thank you. Miss Stevens served as secretary of this church for so many, many, many years. And did a marvelous job for us. Our prayers are constantly daily for her. Anything we can do, call, be sure, and let us know. Let's stand, and you may come to the altar if you wish. May we pray. God, our most gracious Father, who loved us so much that you gave your only begotten Son that he should come, take upon himself our, himself our sins, to die for those sins and resurrect that we might have a right to the tree of life and to thy presence we come, bowed heads and humble hearts to give thanks for another expression of your love and your kindness. Thank you, dear God, for last night lying down and this morning's getting up, for allowing us to make our way out once again to the house of prayer. Before we tell you the things that we stand in need of, we just want to thank you for the things that you've already done in our personal lives. You have been a mighty God. Even if we have not yet come to the understanding that no matter what is going on in our life, we're still blessed. Even though we may not understand why things are happening, we yet want to say thank you for what you're doing in our personal life. We ask to God that you will help us hear your voice. And when we hear your voice, that we will be obedient to the directions that you give us. 
that we will move in the way that you would have us move and speak in the way that you would have us speak. We know that you care for us and you did not bring us into existence without purpose. So, dear God, we thank you for caring for us in our personal life. Help our lives to be all that you would have them be. And as we fall short, sometime day after day, yet have mercy upon us. May your mercy keep us until your grace can save us. And then we thank you for the expression of love that you are making in the lives of our families. We may not be all where we need to be or doing all that we should do. But we thank you, dear God, that you are moving, that you have not given up on us yet. That you are still blessing, that you are still inspiring, that you are still desiring that we be family and as you would have us be. That was the first institution that you set forth. Help us, dear God, to live out its meaning, to live out its purpose. Dear good God, we thank you for another expression of your love in our community, in our city, in our state, in our nation. With all the upheavals that we witness day after day, we still see your hand moving. Things are bad, we must admit. But even in the midst of all of that, we see your hand moving. We see you building hedges and protecting and keeping. We see you forgiving, raising up, dusting off, starting us over again. And we thank you for that expression. And we pray, dear God, that in spite of our shortcoming, that you just have mercy upon us, that you keep inspiring and working and pleading until we arrive where you would have us be. But dear God, keep those who stand in your name. Empower them, bless them. Give them the resources that they need so that they can make the difference that you are desiring to see in this world of ours. Thank you for the expression that you're making in the life of our churches. We pray, dear God, that we see ourselves as instruments in your hand that you want to use to reconcile men to yourself. That there are some boys in the street that you want to claim. There are some girls who are about to give up that you want to claim. There are some men and women who have given up, but you want to claim. And help us to use our hands, our feet, our mouths, whatever you have given us that we might be that instrument that you can bring them to yourself. We thank you, dear God, that and ask you to put in us that spirit that the Father had when he went out to the field, edge of the field every morning, looking to see if his son was returning home. Give us that spirit that we will go to the edge of the field of life and look to see if others are coming home to you. When they come, we will welcome them, embrace them, hug them, kiss up on their necks, and give thanks that they have returned. We pray, dear God, that you will remember those who are going to doctors, those who have been given reports that don't sound so good, conditions happening in their bodies that are very challenging, but dear God, we know that you are a doctor who have never lost a patient. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That you have emptied hospital beds and caused men, women, boys, and girls to get up and walk out. We know that you can do it. So help us, dear God, to just keep the faith. Whatever is being said about our condition, just keep the faith that things will be well. And if you so choose to act in a way that we would not have chosen, help us yet to say, not my will, but your will be done. Accepting because you do it all things well. Now bless us and keep us as our prayer. Amen. Amen.
It's time for our offering, so if those who are in charge will come. the tithe and offering portion of service. May everyone please stand, face the east wall, and obey your ushers in the rear. All of my young men, don't forget. And Dwight, tell us what tables do you, how many tables do you need? And how many? 12 tables. Okay, 12 tables. We'll put the chairs around them. Marcus, do I see my grandsons? Okay. Because I want all of my young men to come. And, I see Derek, but I don't see Aaron and Mark. Okay, all right. But I do want them to come down here and help. The My gift to God is right at $50,000. <clears throat> so thank you for your gift to God. And it has certainly blessed this church. If nothing else claims our attention, may we stand. Someone left some glasses if these are yours they will be up here Now may the grace of the Father and the sweet of the Holy Spirit rest from about us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.